Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Workers in cushy media jobs whining about having to go back to the office a few days a week. What about everyone else who doesn't have that choice? That debate is coming up. But first, yesterday on the show, I said the prosecution in the Kyle Rittenhouse case was on the ropes. 24 hours later, they may be down for the count. The now 18-year-old took the stand, and most importantly, he didn't make any major errors, didn't create any holes. He's accused of shooting three people, two fatally, in Wisconsin during the 2020 unrest after the killing of George Floyd. Now, what everyone needs to remember is that there were two shooting locations at issue. The killing of Joseph Rosenbaum outside a parking lot in downtown Kenosha, and then just down the street, after he's chased, the fatal shooting of Anthony Huber and the shooting of Gage Grosskreutis, who would survive. Now, Rittenhouse at one point broke down when discussing the first scene with Rosenbaum during direct examination. The person that attacked me first threatened to kill me twice. Okay. And the person who threatened to kill you, we now know, is Mr. Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. He screamed, if I catch any of you alone, I'm going to kill you. I look over my shoulder and Mr. Rosenbaum... Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side, um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski, and there were <laughs> there were three people right there. That's what I run. As you see him lunging at you, what do you do? I shoot him. And how many times did you shoot? I believe four. Now, a lot of people are debating, were those real tears, were they not? It kind of doesn't matter. Because the bottom line is, if you're inclined to believe him, you're inclined to believe that they were real tears. And if you're inclined not to believe him, you're going to say, oh, you know, those seem like crocodile tears. And I'm going to explain in a minute why it doesn't really even matter because of the evidence in this case. Before we do that, though, Rittenhouse then discussed, remember, we just talked about the first scene, then discuss the second scene. As you head down Sheridan Road, what's the next thing you remember? The next thing I remember is Anthony Huber striking me in the head with a skateboard. Mr. Huber, immediately after I'm kicked in the face, runs up as I'm sitting up to try to get up and get to the police. I'm on my back and Mr. Huber runs up he, as I'm getting up, he strikes me in the neck with his skateboard a second time. Then what happens? He grabs my gun and I can feel it pulling away from me and this, I can feel the strap starting to come off my, my body. And what do you do then? I fire one shot. Mr. Grosskreutz, he lunges at me with his pistol pointed directly at my head. My rifle is down. His hands are up. His pistol is in his hand. And then Mr. Grosskreutz looks at me. And that's when Mr. Grosskreutz brings his arm down like this. Like he, his arm is like that with me on the ground and his pistol is pointed at me and that's when I shoot him. So when it comes to that second scene, I don't think the prosecution's got a shot at this point of a conviction. It's the first scene that's going to be the one really at issue. Rittenhouse has been charged with six criminal counts. If convicted, he faces the possibility of life behind bars. But at this point, there is one charge I do think he's going to be convicted of. But people aren't talking about it, which is the possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under 18. Wisconsin's an open carry state, still, but it still prohibits 17-year-olds from carrying, and that's a misdemeanor, up to nine months. But beyond that, legally,
The prosecution has to effectively disprove the defense beyond a reasonable doubt. And I don't think that anything changed today apart from the fact that maybe the defense case got just a bit stronger. Joining me now is former prosecutor and legal analyst for Law and Crime Network, Julie Rendleman. Also, Joseph Tully, a criminal defense attorney and a founding partner of Tully and Weiss. Julie, let's start big picture. How did Kyle Rittenhouse do? Uh, he did well. Um, you know, I wasn't as impressed with him. I, I, I think I said to you the other day, if I was the defense attorney, I would not have called him to the stand. I think, um, you know, look, the prosecutor, I I at least towards the end, got him to admit certain things. Uh, again, I'm not sure that they got him anywhere, that they get him anywhere, but he got him to at least admit that there was some recklessness. I use the word recklessness because that's one of the counts um, in regards to the death um, of Mr. Rosenbaum and some recklessness in terms of why he was out there, um, the, the, the need to have a gun, um, the, the aspect of leaving the area when he shouldn't have left the area and, and got him on some inconsistencies. Does it get him there? Does it get the prosecutor there? No. But I think that they would have been better off if he didn't take the stand. Um, all right. Before I well, I was going to play another piece of sound, but um, now I want to get to, I want to get another thought there from uh, from from you. Go ahead. Um, let me get your thought. Joseph, sorry. Okay, well, I, yeah, that's okay. I agree um, that uh, the the defense had a really really good case, and then the defendant took the stand. Um, there was a clear roadmap already laid out with just the prosecution's case. So the burden is always on the government, and everybody knows the government has to prove their case. But think of it like a spotlight. The spotlight is on the government. But when your client takes the stand, when the defendant himself takes the stand, the spotlight shifts right. from the government. I, to okay, the but those, and, but, right. But, but those are all those are all general comments about trials. I'm now asking you specifically about this case. Kyle Rittenhouse took the stand in this case. Do you think it helped mm -hmm. him or hurt him? I think it. I, that if it if you believed him, <laughs> then it helped him. Um, uh, if, I, if you didn't believe you him, what kind of cop out answer is that? I'm not having you on to tell me if you believe him or if you don't believe him. I'm asking you to give me I, your opinion on it. He was emotional. Um, he, I thought he was believable on the stand, but um, I don't. I think that he opened up some inconsistencies that will take away from the the defense otherwise. Okay, I want to play. Um, Actually, let me play some of the cross-examination. I'm going to go to number four in a minute. But um, let's play a piece of the cross-examination here. The one that we had ready to With go. regard to Joseph Rosenbaum, you fired four shots at him, correct? Yes. You intended to kill him, correct? I didn't intend to kill him. I intended to stop the person who was attacking me and trying to steal my gun. Um, all right, I want to play one more piece. Uh, from the prosecution uh, before we go back to you guys. Again, cross-examination cross of Kyle Rittenhouse today. Okay, let me go, let me just go back to you guys. So we saw some of the cross-examination there. There were a lot of questions about whether he actually touched his body, et cetera. Um, one of the biggest points I think that they made on the cross-examination was that Joseph Rosenbaum never touched Kyle Rittenhouse when this incident was occurring, but I'm not sure that that does it uh, for the prosecution. Joseph, how important did you think that that was? I don't think it's important. Legally speaking, if you touch something that somebody else has, a crutch, a cane, an umbrella, and you, uh, you're committing a battery against that person. So legally, it was insignificant. He grabbed the gun and um, there was soot on his hand from being his hand being close to where the barrel is. So the inference is that he was attempting to grab the gun, and I think it justifies self-defense. Um, Julie, you agree? Well, I mean, there's two arguments. There's an argument that he's grabbing the, the, the gun because the guy's about to shoot him, so he's trying to prevent him from doing that. The issue is that if you're going to pick the two, it goes in favor of the defense because that's the way the law works. If the evidence is even, the jury's going to go with what the defense says um, because there's no clear indication that he was doing one or the other. And so that's why I think the defense is going to be successful um, because, again, I hate using beyond reasonable doubt, but that really is all this is about. And the, jur uh, and the prosecutor just hasn't proven it, even in regards to a reckless act. All right. <laughs> 
we're having some problems here with some of our sound bites. Let's take a break. We will come back in a minute. I'm going to ask you guys to stick around because there's a lot of sound that I want to play from this case because it was amazing today. Take a quick break. We'll come back with more sound from the Kyle Rittenhouse case in a moment. I didn't intend to kill them. I intended to, I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. Everybody that you shot at that night, you intended to kill, correct? I didn't intend to kill them. I intended to, I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. By killing them? I did what I had to do to stop the person who was attacking me. I mean, that's the right answer. When you're asked that question, the danger was that he would say something that would get him into more trouble. He didn't. We're continuing our coverage of the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Huge day. In court, still with us is Julie Rendleman and uh, Joseph Tully. Um, you know, I want to go uh, back for a moment to the, remember, I've described this before as two scenes. You've got scene one, where the prosecution has a better chance here. Scene two, where I think they basically have no chance anymore because one of the people, the surviving victim, admits that he pointed a gun at Kyle Rittenhouse. Joseph, just so we can dispense of this, you agree, right, at this point on the attempted homicide um, of that victim who survived, they have no chance when he admits he pointed a gun at, at Rittenhouse, right? I agree that 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 count has gone out the window, but they haven't dismissed it yet. Right. Meaning right. the more I stuff mean, they throw on the wall, the, the jury might compromise. So it still has some value to the prosecution. I don't know that I agree with that. Well, then I was going to move on. But, Julie, I don't agree with that. I think that they would have been better off if they hadn't even charged that because I think they've lost credibility with the jury by suggesting it's an attempted homicide when the guy admits that he, that he he's pointing his weapon at Rittenhouse. But, but Dan, do you think they actually expected him to say that? Because it seems like everyone in the room was shocked uh, when, when he came out with that. I mean, there was an argument to be made that maybe the gun wasn't totally pointed. It's not until he really makes it clear and articulates it to everyone in the jury, for the jury pool, that he, in fact, pointed it, that everyone knows without a question that, in fact, there is the self-defense built in. So I'm not sure the prosecution knew it was going to happen. That may be true. Let me play. This is from Cross. This is number five coming up here. This is from the cross examination of the defendant talking about that surviving victim and what he was thinking as he ended up shooting him. In this moment, you told us Gage Grosskreutz is a threat to you right now. Yes. He's got a pistol not aimed at you. You've got an AR-15 aimed at him. Why is he more of a threat to you than you are to him? Because he was, he was moving at me with a gun in his hand. This is right after you've killed Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. Right after you fired two shots at almost point blank range at the man running towards the camera right now and missing him, correct? Yes. And you're telling us Gage Grosskreutz is the real threat at this moment? Yes. I don't know. That doesn't seem to me to get him any points. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Julie, does that get the defense, does that get the prosecution any points here? No. I mean, the fact that both of them were a threat to each other doesn't really change the fact that the defendant's the one on trial and the prosecution has to prove the self-defense. And so right. it, it doesn't negate the fact that he still views him as as bringing deadly you know, danger to him, um, so, so, so to speak. So, so no, I don't think it well, makes I difference. I want to, Joseph, I want to, because, because Joseph, you seem a little more skeptical, a little more supportive of the possibility mm -hmm. the prosecution could still get a conviction here. So I want to place number two. I want to play a piece of sound, and this is from the pathologist, right? Because the key question, I think we all would agree, is can Kyle Rittenhouse show that it was self-defense at that first scene? Unarmed guy, Rosenbaum, shoots him four times. That's going to be the critical question. And I have to say, when I heard the pathologist's testimony on this issue, I was A, surprised, and B, said to myself, whoa, wait a second. I don't know how they're going to overcome this. So let's play. This is uh, the pathologist talking about this issue. As I'm turning around, Mr. Rosenbaum is, I would say, from me to where the judge is uh, coming at me, 
with his arms out in front of him, he, he, I remember his hand on the barrel of my gun. There is no soot stippling here, correct? Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. The bulk of it starts between what would be the ring and commonly referred to as middle finger? Yes. Okay, so that means the barrel of the gun, if not touching, would have been like this. It's in that location, that's okay. correct. So that hand was over the barrel of Mr. Rittenhouse's gun when his hand was shot. That makes sense. That makes sense. Joseph, that to me was devastating to the prosecution. Logically speaking, correct. We are dealing with a jury. Uh, prosecutors have a wide margin of error. They could be perceived as stupid, lazy, um, mean, arrogant. It doesn't matter. That's why the prosecutor is doing what he's doing and keeping a straight face and moving on no matter what. <laughs> I think that's an indirect way of saying yes. This was a big, big problem for the prosecution in this case because it is. Um, now, I want to do this. So the, the judge got furious at the prosecutor. and Everyone's making such a big deal about this. I don't know that it's that big a deal, but I want to play this. This is number three of the judge getting furious at the prosecutor. Why would you think that that made it okay for you without any advance notice to bring this matter before the jury? You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law. It's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. And it gives, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I don't know what you're up to. All right, so Julie, obviously everyone was making a big deal because, you know, when you hear a judge yelling at a lawyer, everyone, oh, well, you know, but in the end, I don't think it even, I don't think it even matters. I mean, do you? No, I mean, look, I, you know, if the jury, look, the, the jury wasn't in the room when he's doing the, the bulk of his screaming, but if a jury respects the judge and the judge is clear in terms of animosity towards one side or the other, the jury is going to be impacted, um, you know, by that. With that said, when a prosecutor or defense attorney acts inappropriately to this extent, then the judge has every right to call him out and let the jury know that he's misbehaving. Yeah. And I think it's clear that, look, I think the prosecution's getting desperate is what I think happened. I think that the prosecution's getting very nervous. I think they realize their case is falling apart. And as a result, they're making a, they're taking chances they shouldn't be taking. They're making rookie errors, et cetera. But let me do this. Let me ask you both to, to stick around because we've got a lot more, including a motion to end the case, which the judge says he's taking under advisement. We'll talk about whether that is real coming up in a moment. You're telling us that the reason that you wanted Dominic to buy you an AR-15 as opposed to a pistol is, is the only reason was because you felt you couldn't lawfully possess a pistol? Correct. You didn't pick out the AR-15 for any other reason? I thought it looked cool, um, but no. You didn't pick it out because you wanted to go hunting with it, did you? No. You didn't pick it out because you were going to um, use it to protect your house, correct? Correct. You picked it out because it looked cool. I thought it looked cool. Guess it, that's the reason, yes. On the big picture questions, so what? So he picked out a particular weapon because it looked cool. Again, I'm not defending him morally. I'm just saying it's a legal matter. I don't know that it matters. But when it comes to the question of the gun charge in this case, Julie Rendleman, also joined by Joseph Tully. Um, Julie Rendleman, I don't see how they really defend against the gun charge in this case, which is possession of a dangerous weapon by someone under the age of 18. It seems that they're making some argument that under state law, they're permitted, he's permitted to have the gun, but I, I think it's a long shot. Yeah, I, I, you know, they discussed this, I think, in preliminary hearings, and, and, and to me, it, it didn't add up to anything. I'll be frank with you, though. If, if the prosecution walks away from this case 
with a conviction on a misdemeanor where two people were killed and one was almost killed, they have technically lost this case. And so that is no victory as far as the prosecution's concerned, if that's all they walk away with. But I, I think at the end of the day, that is probably at the very least what they're going to get. Right. I think they're going to get that. I think maybe they'll get a hung jury um, on the Rosenbaum um, issue, maybe. And they're definitely not, I don't think, going to be able to get convictions on the other two. But there was an interesting debate about a mistrial today, Joseph Tully. And it's sort of curious to me because the defense is asking for a mistrial, but there's no way they actually want to end this case, right? The defense has got to want, they've got to know we're doing great. Things are going well. The last thing we'd want is another trial. So they're asking for a mistrial, what's called with prejudice. But I'm going to talk about that in a minute. First, let's play the sound. I did not interpret your ruling as an absolute. We, we've had three state motions in the last. There was one in which we asked the court to introduce evidence that the defendant was at Pudgy's Bar with Proud Boys, and you were clear that is not coming in. There was. You know, don't get into other subjects. Get it. Get, come on, what you're telling me. You're an experienced trial attorney, and you're telling me that when the judge says, I'm excluding this, you just to take it upon yourself to put it in because you think that you've found a way around it? Come on. This is my good faith explanation to you, and if you want to yell at me, you can. My good faith feeling this morning after watching that testimony was you had left the door open a little bit, now we had something new, and I was going to probe it. I don't believe you. There better not be another incident. I'll take the motion under advisement. All right. So, Joseph Tully, you know, I got asked by a lot of people who aren't lawyers, you know, wow, it's taking it under advisement. What does it mean? Yeah, the reality, it means he's not doing it. But if, if they do it again, what? I mean, so what if the prosecution wants to end this case because it's going so badly? Is it possible the judge would dismiss the case and not allow prosecutors to bring the case again? I, I doubt that. I mean, at the most, I think the judge would grant a mistrial. The judge is not going to want to take away the, the ability of the jury to decide this case. They've come along this far. So at the most, if the prosecution does something very extraordinarily out of bounds, the judge will declare a mistrial but allow them to re-prosecute. But, but Julie, that seems troubling because the prosecution are the ones who want a mistrial at this point, meaning there's no way the defense wants to end this case now. The defense has got to know things are going well for them. The notion of getting a mistrial and the possibility of the prosecutors getting to start from scratch would be a big win for prosecutors, no? Absolutely. But you realize they're creating grounds for appeal. They, they know the judge is not going to declare a mistrial. They right. know the judge is not going to declare a mistrial with prejudice. But they also know if there's a conviction, all these errors, by the way, these are this is prosecutorial misconduct. And I believe there's bad faith in some of what he did. And if that exists, then they're going to have fantastic grounds for appeal if there's a conviction. So we've now taken it one level further. We have said that, that it is going to be very difficult for prosecutors to get a conviction here on anything but the gun charge. And if they do, that there are real grounds for an appeal. This case is a mess. That's where it is. And the, 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 the bottom line is you both are nodding in agreement. Julie Rendleman and Joseph Tully, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, there is no shortage of important news these days. But actor Paul Rudd being named People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive, that's news? You'd think it's big, important stuff if you've been news channel surfing lately. It's coming up. Time now for our Mediaite Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. There is a lot going on in the world these days. Supply chain issues threaten the holidays. There's inflation. Political divisions may have never been worse. So let's check in on the morning news to see how they're covering the most important issues of the day. It's time for the morning buzz. People magazine crowning Paul Rudd, the 2021 sexiest man alive, following in the footsteps of Michael B. Jordan last year. Yay, people, sexiest man alive is Paul Rudd. Look, I like Paul Rudd. Smart, he's funny, and yes, he's sexy. But this surely can't be widely reported on news channels. Right? People Magazine named their new sexiest man alive yesterday. Who was it? Who was it? Paul Rudd. 
Really? Really? The man from the University of Kansas. Wow. Paul, Paul Rudd. Yeah, he's funny. All right, so Fox and Friends offering some lighter fare, but at CNN, they take themselves too seriously to cover this, right? People magazine actually named their 2021 sexiest man alive. He is a comedian. He is a superhero. He, so he's funny. He has really good hair. I don't know. The profile kind of looks like you, John Berman. Who do you think it is, though? Well, we can't. If, you, if it's just really good hair, it can't be me. Because it, <laughs> it would have to be great hair if it were me. But go on. We know who this is. Announce it. All right. The sexiest man alive is Paul Rudd. Many shows took the bait and chose to fill their airtime by simply reading a press release from People Magazine meant to promote People Magazine and some random choice they made. How do we know that? Because they all reported the exact same anecdote from that press release. Rudd actually said that he hoped to be invited to those sexy dinners with Clooney, Pitt, and Michael B. Jordan. To some of those sexy dinners with Clooney and Pitt and Jordan. Invited to some of those sexy dinners with previous winners George Clooney and Brad Pitt. Those sexy dinners with Clooney and Pitt and Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so every show with the exact same comment. Almost like it was fed to them. But at least some ask questions while covering this non-story. People magazine has named Paul Rudd the sexiest man alive for 2021. Now, it's probably no coincidence that his new movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife, hits theaters later this month. Ah, good for CNN's Kim Brunhuber for calling that out. What he didn't say is that Sony Pictures probably has a huge marketing budget to buy advertisements in People and on those very stations. And we'll let you figure it out from there. But in all of this, I give the views Joy Behar props for calling it like it is. This is ridiculous, this thing they do every year, The Sexiest Man Alive. It's a huge exaggeration. It's very limited to uh, show business country. What about a hot guy in Belarus or Slovenia? How do we know that this yeah. is the sexiest man alive in the whole world? It's insane. And let me just point out that, no, I'm not bitter that I didn't make the list. That's not why I did this. That's our wrap-up of the day's media bias buzz and the bull. Coming up, speaking of media, media folks upset about having to go back to the office even for just a couple of days a week. They've now filed a complaint. Most people don't have the luxury of working from home. That debate's up next. Welcome back. I feel like almost every day I read about how corporate America is grappling with returning to the office after more than a year of working remotely. Every time I see one of these stories, I think about the vast majority of Americans who never had the luxury of being able to work from home in the first place. The latest example of this comes courtesy of the Hearst Corporation's magazine division, which publishes very good and fancy magazines like Cosmopolitan, Esquire, Men's Health, Town and Country, the fanciest titles with some of the highest paying jobs in the industry. Now more than 300 employees, a majority of Hearst's approximately 550 magazine division workers, 450 of them are part of Hearst Magazine Media Union, have signed a petition objecting to the company's plan to have them return to the office starting next week. On social media, the union also filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board. They blasted Hearst for the policy, saying the publisher failed to negotiate the policy in good faith with workers. And just to be clear, here's what's being asked of these workers. For the first two weeks, these media workers are expected to come in the office once a week. After that, workers are expected to be in the office twice a week until early 2022. And eventually, these media folks will be required to be in-house three days a week. Hearst is also requiring that all employees be vaccinated. Now, in these parts, it's not the vaccination they're objecting to, but the fact that they have to go into the office. These pampered employees want more workplace flexibility because being able to work from home twice a week is apparently not enough. One member of the union's bargaining committee who spoke to the New York Times said that his colleagues didn't want to be required to return to the office because they didn't want to give up, quote, the extra hour of sleep in the morning when they're not commuting. Never mind the fact that most Americans would be ecstatic over the idea of being able to work at a prominent magazine from home once a week, let alone twice a week. According to the Department of Labor, Last month, less than 12% of American workers worked from home, 
because of the pandemic, down from just over 13% in September. But the numbers were never that high to begin with. If you listen to the mainstream media, you might presume that the vast majority of Americans are working from home at some point in the last 20-something months. And I actually presume that to be the case as well. But the reality is that a minority of Americans were ever able to work from home. In May 2020, the first month the Bureau of Labor Statistics collected data on pandemic-related remote work, about 35% of American workers did work from home. By that July, the number was down to about 26%. Hearst is not the only company dealing with these privileged issues right now. Condé Nast, which publishes The New Yorker and Vanity Fair and Vogue, is also facing pressure from its workers' union over its plans to return to work in person. That's set to take effect next week. Other companies, apparently spooked by a wave of strikes across the private sector, are trying to placate their workers by offering extended time off around holidays like Thanksgiving. Some have gone as far as to give these new policies gimmicky names like PTO, Palooza, Recharge Week, and Operation Chillax. I like working from home, too. And we have some pretty cushy jobs here, let me be clear. But all the employees of this show come to the office every day. Hearst employees are being asked to come into the office a few days a week, and they make it sound like they're working overtime in coal mines. Working from home is a luxury. I think that these media folks also tend to be a little left of center and claim that they're looking out for the little guys, but let's be clear. People with low-wage jobs paid by the hour are both at a higher risk of getting the virus because they can't isolate without giving up a paycheck and also more susceptible to the pandemic's economic fallout. In other words, the people helping them stay home by driving trucks or delivering their goods, picking up their takeout orders, delivering their mail, fixing their cars, are the ones most at risk both medically and financially because of the virus. And they're showing up every day. We reached out to both Hearst and the union for comment, but have not heard back. Joining me now to discuss is occupational health researcher and University of Washington assistant professor Marissa Baker. She believes that working from home, of course, has its advantages. Professor, thanks very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Do you think I am being unfair in my commentary here? Hi, Dan. So what I really like that you're talking about is, you know, reminding your viewers of how few people can actually work from home. I think that's um, you're absolutely right about that. Um, you know, research I did early in the pandemic that predates those um, those data you showed from BLS, you know, I was estimating 25% of Americans are able to work from home and those that are tend to be whiter, they tend to be male, um, and they tend to be higher paid. So certainly you're absolutely correct that there are a, a very large swath, um, part of the American workforce who, ever, who either were never able to work from home or who lost their jobs because they were not able to work from home when, you know, like hospitality and so, um, retail. So let me ask you, as someone who studies this stuff, right, does it offend you when you hear these people sort of making these complaints, filing union complaints about this idea that, my goodness, we're being asked to come in one day a week and then two days a week and then three days a week. I mean, there's something about this that, that I find to be so offensive. And I'm wondering, someone like yourself, who's, who's you know, studied this and talked about the advantages and disadvantages of working from home, but when you hear something like that, do you have the same response that I do, or are you more understanding? You know, um, I can see why you have that response, and I think that you're right that a lot of people likely do. Um, what I'm understanding, to, understanding toward is organized labor and um, the right for employees to collectively bargain um, and things around work schedule and when your work schedule begins and how many days you're in and out of the office. Um, you know, those are things that unions have historically bargained for. And what it sounds like happened here maybe is that the worker perspective was not included on the, at the bargaining table. So um, while I love for all workers to have more flexibility, um, and this is, um, you know, an, an offensive example to you, to me, I'm more offended by the, um, the lack of the employer employee voice in collective bargaining. So, so in this case, let's assume for a moment that the employer made the decision without consulting enough, right, with the employees. Let's assume, you know, they may dispute it, but let's assume that that's a fact. You're more bothered by that than you are about these relatively well-paid media folks who are whining about the fact that they have to go into the office. 
Well, I mean, we don't know the, the pay of them. Um, and perhaps you would know better than I, um, being in the industry. Um, but yeah. nothing causes me offense per se. I just, um, you know, I think that when um, workers' voices aren't heard, whether it's in a white-collar, well-paying job or a blue-collar, um, you know, construction job, then that's yeah. a breakdown of the, the power that workers have. Yeah. But see, again, I, and I think maybe I hold the media to a different standard because of the power that they have, right? And the influence they can have because of the magazines they work for, et cetera. And to me, to be whining about this is so tone deaf, as far as I'm concerned, that that's the part about it where I don't compare it, right, to just a, your typical blue collar worker who has real union concerns. And I'm not suggesting it. Therefore, there's no reason for these people to, to create a union. But when you create a union in the media space, in a white collar position like this, and the big issue that you now want to fight over is the fact that you don't want to have to come into the office once a week, twice a week, and then three times a week, I think is just, a, I think it gives unions and these media folks a bad name. You get the final word. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are lots of reasons that people want to work from home. It's multifactorial. Um, some people may be caring for children still who are out of school or loved ones. Um, they may have moved out of the area. Um, they may have adopted a pet that they want to spend time with. I mean, you know that quality but, of but, but, but think about that. But think about that. They adopted a pet they want to spend time with, okay? That's terrific. I love that idea, particularly if they adopted from a shelter. Awesome. But the notion that that somehow should become a reason to not have to go into the office seems to me absurd. It's like the idea of using the pandemic to say, oh, you know what? So I've done something for myself. And you know, now that we had this pandemic, I can avoid going into work because I can get my union to go complain about it and try and prevent them from, have, from being able to execute on this. I mean, that's problematic. Yeah, I mean, I think the world of work has forever changed because of the pandemic. And so it's um, hard to think about ever going back to normal. Workers have more power now and they are using it. And people have realized yeah. that lives are as important as work and that work should fit in to their life, not their life fitting around work. So, yeah, well, all right. Professor Baker, thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Coming up. Officers checking out a suspicious vehicle when the driver takes off, dragging the officers with them. This video caught on dash cam up next. Time for our police cam segment showing the dangers officers face every day. We're going to show you some police cam video in a moment, but this starts with a 911 call from an apartment complex employee in Colorado who noticed a strange vehicle in a carport. Um, underneath uh, building 15, there seems to be, I don't know if they're squatters or just in passing, but we've never seen the car here and there's two in individuals in there, a male and female, maybe in the about 30s. What and kind of car is it? It's a uh, maroon Kia Optima. If you have, have any a, in the area, it's two nine five Nevada plate and they're a... Uh, they're like passed out or asleep with the car running and another resident parks there and they're like kind of unresponsive. Now, while officers in Englewood near Denver were on the way, they found out the Kia Optima was stolen. The man behind the wheel, Caleb Grisenti, was wanted on two active warrants. Officers then tried to pull Grisenti from the vehicle. Grisenti had hit the gas. See that? Oof. Sending officers tumbling and pinning them against a wall. Officer Stephen Cray was dragged by the car and smashed into a police vehicle as Grisenti sideswiped it. Still shot the suspect. Sergeant David LeClaire also fired, hitting Grisenti, who crashed into a garage and died at the hospital. Cray and two other officers were taken to the hospital and have recovered. The woman in the passenger seat was not hurt. Joining us now to take us through this is... Chief Anthony Paparo of the Yaden, Pennsylvania Police Department. Thanks for coming back. Appreciate it. All right. So 
dangerous situation with a suspect parked next to a concrete wall. What do officers have to consider in a space like that? In, in a space like that, they got to consider the possibility that they could get harmed if the individual decides to flee like this guy did. Uh, I, what they probably didn't were, weren't aware of initially was that he had a warrant for escape. Uh, one of, that was one of the warrants that was listed in the DA's report. Uh, but they have to be very cognizant of what they're doing there when they're approaching the vehicle. Now, the, the suspect refuses to get out of the car, then puts it in drive and speeds out. Let's, let's watch that again. The sergeant said there were actually landscapers and a man with a walker nearby. And that is another factor that they have to consider in a situation when shots are fired. Yeah, one of the things that's uh, really good about this video is that it reiterates the fact that the video doesn't, body cams don't show you everything. So it's great that there were actually other witnesses there that could corroborate what the officer's actions were as a result of what the actor did in this case. Uh, the one officer that you, you actually can't see him as he's being crushed against the side of the car, the sergeant that fired from the outside, he may not have been aware that the officer that was being crushed was a, actually to able to discharge his weapon to try and protect himself and stop the crushing of his body against the patrol car. Uh, but the witnesses there, they're able to now corroborate what the body cam can't see because it, it only sees what's in front of them. And that one officer that got thrown up in the air and was crushed against the wall as the vehicle was speeding past, his body camera is going up in the air. You can't see the officer that's still in the car being crushed as he sideswipes the police car. So the witnesses there are actually beneficial for the police. And I, and I should say, and we're out of time, um, that the, um, the fact that the body cam uh, showed that, as you pointed out, from two different angles allowed us to, to get a better perspective of exactly what happened. And the good news is that the woman who was inside that car was not injured either. So exactly. it means that, that the shots that they, that they directed were at the right place. Chief, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime starts right now. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.